Halo fans have been waiting a long time for Halo Infinite. The Halo series wasn't doing too hot in the 2010s, mainstream interests seemed to more or less fizzle out after Bungie moved on, and the games that were made by the new franchise Shepard 343 were divisive, not really appealing to a broad audience and causing just more infighting than excitement within the core Halo community that will honestly buy anything with the Halo name stamped on it, whether we like it or not. It's in our blood. We love Halo, right? Through good times and bad, we've always been with the series. But I know I'm not alone when I say that I feel like the series was kind of losing sight of itself with Halo 4 and Halo 5. Halo's identity is such a specific thing, you know? The look of the Spartan's armor, the sound of the shield recharge, the music, the hum of an overcharged plasma pistol. There's so many tiny details that make a Halo game feel magical to me. It's been a long time since Halo has given me that feeling of, God, I love Halo. That is until now. If you're worried about spoilers, don't worry, I'm not here to ruin things for you. I'm going to break up my review into gameplay, graphics, audio, and story. So if you enjoyed the review, giving it a like and sharing it around would be appreciated seeing as it helps the channel, and let's get started. So gameplay comes first. If you've ever played a Halo game before, especially since the MCC is now available on both PC and console, you know that despite its age, the original developers struck gold with the way that Halo's enemies were designed. They always came in squads, and the players were trained to anticipate things like grunts panicking if you kill an elite, jackals would flinch if you shoot their hand, and run if you take down their shield, and so on and so on. The Covenant combat loop and AI behavior routines were solid. So solid that Halo Infinite not only takes it, but builds upon it instead of reinventing it. Halo Infinite's enemy AI are really fun to go up against, and you can tell that 343 spent a lot of time making sure that the personality of each enemy was represented through their behaviors, animations, and in some case even their facial expressions. I feel like 343 took a lot of people's criticisms with the AI animations and behaviors in Halo 4 and 5 and funneled that feedback into how they designed The Banished. The Banished are really fun to go up against. And that's not to say that the Banished AI are flawless, I have had many instances of AI getting caught up on geometry, especially those little like energy tethers that hold captive marines and Banished propaganda speakers, but those are really just nitpicks. Any moment you're engaging the Banished on foot, the game is an absolute blast, and the way that the AI adapt to their surroundings is really cool too. You can see Banished scrambling to switch out their loadouts, grunts sprinting for shade turrets to man, or in the case of the Brutes, sometimes lobbing fusion coils or even grunts at the player when annoyed enough. Something that I think makes the combat so fun as well is the emphasis on every weapon having a role to fill, whether it be the ammo type or the functionality of the gun, or even unique and quirky gimmicks that they have. Brute weapons all have these like blades on them, which grant improved melee damage, so you could shoot the helmet off a brute with a mangler and then instantly beat him to the ground with the blade on the mangler. The Ravager's alt fire mode can lay down a fire trap, and you can use that to kind of control and corral enemy movement. The Heat Wave can even make direct confrontation unnecessary, since the Heat Wave can reflect shots around corners to snag any hiding enemies. I do find that some weapons and vehicles miss the mark a tad. The lack of the classic Halo shotgun is felt in this campaign, and the fact that the equipment can't be dropped and used by the enemies like in multiplayer is a really big missed opportunity. And while I love the grappling hook, absolutely love it, it does tend to be really the only useful gadget, easily outshining all of the other gadgets. Getting places is simply faster and easier with the grappling hook than it is even a vehicle. Getting around a combat arena is simply faster and easier with the grappling hook than using stairs or man cannons. Even engaging with enemy vehicles is faster and easier with the grappling hook than using a vehicle or proper anti-vehicle weaponry. As cool as the grappling hook is, I do think that it's maybe a little bit too overpowered. That could bring a lot of fun, it's ultimately up to personal preference, it's just how I felt while I played it. In mentioning vehicles though, I think we should probably move on over to that. The on-foot gameplay kicks ass in my opinion. I do think the gameplay suffers during vehicle combat. 
When I think of Halo's best vehicle sequences, I think of the brute chopper chases on the fields of Savo Highway, racing Covenant ghosts through the tunnels of Metropolis from Halo 2, both of the series' iconic warthog runs, and so on. Even the scarab battles from Halo 3 and ODST, these large sandboxy zones full of vehicles at play that are there to either drive through or just engage with. There are no scarab battles in Halo Infinite, no epic vehicle chase sequences, or anything. Most enemy vehicle encounters in this game are tethered to grassy clearings that have maybe two or three ghosts, which always make sure to face the player. Not really driving around that much, and due to how weak the player's own vehicles are, you end up with a vehicle always kind of entering its doomed state, which forces you on foot. And the choppers themselves are so unwieldy in this game that even the banished seem to struggle with them. There's this one boss later on in the campaign who had a chopper of his own, and if it tells you anything, he managed to flip over his chopper in less than two minutes of the boss fight, forcing him to be on foot for the remainder of the fight. Wraiths, like the ghosts, are just driven too defensively by the enemy in this game. They are never showing their weak point to the player, to the point that these large machines will spin at comical speeds just so that their weak point isn't facing you, which really only leaves you with two options to take them down. One is grapple hooking onto the turret seat of the wraith, which always forces the driver out of it, or shooting at the wraith till it's dead, which is slower, so just use the grappling hook. So when combining the annoying AI vehicle behaviors, the player's own weak vehicle armor, and the really just flat and sterile looking vehicle explosions, it leads to vehicle combat feeling like a sloppy, disappointing downgrade from the Master Chief collection. No Scarab Battles especially is such a disappointment considering the size of the world, which feels ripe for massive banished scarabs stomping across it. What won't disappoint though, thankfully, are the Sentinels. So Sentinels in this game are actually pretty cool. In previous Halo games, the Sentinels weren't really an enemy type. They were designed more like a level hazard that would interfere with both the player and Covenant troops. In Halo Infinite, the Sentinels are designed to be an official enemy type with their own body language, AI behaviors, and the such. They are intensely fun to fight. Their glowing eyes are so eerie when they lock onto you, and the crunchy explosion of their carcasses is such a blast. They just erupt into these fireballs when destroyed, and you can hear the machine screeching and grinding as it falls to the ground. The Sentinels feel just juicy and punchy and really fun to blow up in this game. Same with Halo Infinite's new addition to the combat loop, the Skimmers. I love these little guys, and love what they bring to the gameplay, and I hope to see more of them in the future. Halo Infinite is a fantastic time. Any moment I was infiltrating a banished stronghold, I was having a blast. With the only areas of improvement I think the game could use are spending a bit more time on giving vehicle combat and the explosions of those vehicles the same frenetic energy that the MCC titles had. It's a huge missed opportunity to not give the banished equipment that they can use, or even revive some of Halo's best sandbox encounters like the Scarab. But what 343 made here in Halo Infinite is a solid solid combat loop. It's a great foundation with a lot of room to grow and expand it as Halo Infinite is updated into the future. This is Halo's best combat loop in years, and I can't understate that enough. On the graphics front, I feel like you can definitely tell that this game engine was tough to get running for the type of game that the team were making, but that doesn't stop the game from looking pretty regardless thanks to really solid art direction. It's got some really impressive vistas, and if you can ignore the lack of shadows and detail at a distance, the scale of the game world is kind of overwhelming at first. Halo's never really had play spaces this large before, and 343's new approach to their art style means that it sort of looks like a 4K version of the game that we all played when we were younger. There's something that's just hard to describe about finding Banished in the woods, checking my motion tracker for movement, and then seeing grunts just give up and panic that tingles the nostalgia centers of my brain. The nostalgia centers of my brain are especially hit hard in the Forerunner environments. 343's artists assembled what have to be some of the prettiest Forerunner locations in any Halo game. I mean, god damn, that is a pretty looking cave. This game is probably some of the best use of screen space reflections I've ever seen in a Halo game as well. 
And when slowing down and just sticking your face into any of the character models that you gun down, you'll notice an unusually high level of detail that most games don't sport. Modern Warfare and Battlefield may have more advanced and sophisticated graphics engines, and the environments and lighting in games like Battlefield 1 do look better than Halo Infinite, but I can't really say that the texture quality of their character models compares to some of the stuff seen in Halo Infinite. Where I do think the game falls a bit short visually is in outdoor environments. It's not that it looks bad per se, but I do think the game looks much better during the day than it does at night. Something about the way that shadows are handled in Halo Infinite it just looks off in a way I can't quite put my finger on. I do notice also that anything beyond maybe 50 or so meters of the player tends to lose their shadow, which can make what are usually really impressive vistas in something like Red Dead 2 look just a bit off in Halo Infinite, like some shadow or detail pass is missing or something. I did find that the game looked much better on my PC when running the game on max settings, though my poor 1080 Ti was struggling to maintain even 50 frames per second, which probably just means I need an upgrade to my PC. I also think that it's a huge missed opportunity that the game really only comes in three flavors of visual style. You're either in the woods with pine trees everywhere, in a Forerunner location, or in a Banished location. There's no desert, there's no snow, there's no rain, there's no foggy mornings or anything. Visually, it always kind of looks like the second level of the first Halo game. But what was great about the first Halo game is that the biomes could change on a level per level basis. One level, you're on a beach. The next level, you're in the snow. The next level, you're in a swamp, and so on. You don't really have that in Halo Infinite. You really only get one biome. And then, of course, the Forerunner and Banished environments. In general, Halo Infinite is stunning. I do think that work can be done on making explosions look and feel more lively, but the game does a really good job within the limitations of the Slipspace engine to provide a readable and beautiful environment. I do hope that 343 takes advantage of the live service nature of Halo Infinite to provide tweaks and upgrades to the visuals over time. So during development, there are all sorts of graphical techniques and styles that have to kind of be cut due to time constraints. So could you imagine how cool it would be if 343 added graphical effects and settings that had to be cut during development? Now that the game is out, they could revisit some of these more advanced graphical settings and properly integrate them into the game, allowing Halo Infinite to age beautifully as it's updated. I'd love to see graphical patches that add more complexity to the shadows, maybe even a filmic per object motion blur like something you'd see in Doom Eternal, better explosions, and so on. The game is just ripe for this kind of stuff. Halo Infinite is a really good looking game. It's not really up to the same standard as some of the other AAA games releasing, but it's also beautiful in its own right. So the audio. I really love the audio design of Halo Infinite. I'm not really talking about the actual sound of individual assets, which I will get into, but the way it just all comes together, you know? Games like Battlefield 1 use audio as an atmospheric tool, making you feel immersed in the world around you. Halo has never really aimed for realistic audio design. Instead, it uses audio as a gameplay tool. Why do you think the shield recharge sound is so damn memorable? It's because it's so unique in the audio spectrum that we know the state of our health purely based on the sounds that our shields are making. They're sounds that complement the gameplay. We don't need grenade danger indicators in a Halo game because we know what a plasma grenade sounds like when it's charging up for an explosion. Halo Infinite probably has the strongest gameplay-driven audio design of a shooter since, well, Doom Eternal in my opinion. Nothing feels purposeless or just done for the sake of being noisy. And the team took a lot of time making sure that each audio asset was so unique that it couldn't be mistaken for something else. There was this moment during gameplay when I was running along a forest path, and I heard a whirring sound that was slightly louder than the ambient wind, and I instantly recognized that whirring sound as a banished ghost. I also need to compliment the music direction and its implementation. So, Marty O'Donnell, Michael Salvatore, and later C. Paul Johnson were responsible for Halo's incredibly iconic musical direction. No other shooter had music quite like Halo, and once those original musical shepherds left the series, their absence was certainly felt by me. Halo 4 and Halo 5 had good soundtracks, but they felt like they were just 
lacking the magic and uniqueness that the original Halo games had. They just kind of sounded like other video games to me, and they didn't stick in my mind. With Halo Infinite, though, 343 assembled a trio of composers. Curtis Schweitzer, Joel Korolitz, and Gareth Coker. Cocker? Coker. Coke. All of whom have very different musical backgrounds. These three composers, in my opinion, have crafted the best soundtrack for a mainline Halo game since Halo Reach. And the actual audio team at 343 used their music very well in the game. What's really nice about this soundtrack is that it's quite comfortable with using old and familiar songs like Undercover of Night or A Walk in the Woods, following O'Donnell and Salvatore's trend of iterating and refining on past tunes. But when Halo Infinite creates new melodies that I haven't heard before in a Halo game, it uses that connective tissue to Halo's musical legacy to craft original music that still retains that Halo DNA. Some of the songs in this game feel like lost Marty O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore pieces. If anyone important at 343 is watching this, the musical direction for Halo Infinite is perfect. From the soft, dreamlike choirs, flutes and fantastical strings, tribalistic drums, tasteful synths, and so on, this is a musical direction that filled me with that same magic that Halo 4, 5, and Halo Wars 2's soundtracks failed to. I hope to see these three composers again in the future working on Halo music, and those responsible at 343 for integrating their music into the game need a raise. This is fantastic work all around. So something I also need to commend is the audio team's attention to detail in making Halo-y music work in a more open-worldy environment. Something that Marty O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore did a lot in their Halo soundtracks is whenever you were approaching an encounter, usually a low string would rise within the audio mix. It would sustain itself. And then as you initiated combat, more layers would start to get added to it. In this game, the same thing happens. Usually if you're wandering in the open world, and you suddenly start to hear a string rise in the audio mix. You know that you're about to encounter some Banished, and when you fire that first shot, boom, the drums come into the audio mix. It's just, God, they nailed it. There are a few individual audio assets that I do think fall a bit short, mainly the chain gun sound on the Warthog turret, which just sounds really flat and lacks that meat grinder sound that a turret should have. I also feel like the impact sounds were not given a lot of priority in the audio spectrum, so the hit marker sounds are quite nice in Halo Infinite. But if you want a more organic soundscape and disable those hit marker sounds, you'll notice that a lot of the crunch and impact from previous Halo games is simply missing here. Almost like the sound design never expected the player to turn off the hit markers, so they just didn't put in the effort to make organic impacts on enemies or the world around you feel meaty. Those are mostly just small nitpicks though, because otherwise, Halo Infinite has awesome sound design. I genuinely struggled to come up with criticisms. It's really good stuff here. So the story. I really liked Halo Infinite's story, and I feel that it mostly hit all the marks it needed to hit. Taking place many years after the events of Halo 5, Halo Infinite not only needed to provide closure to the Reclaimer saga that ended with Halo 5, it needed to set the stage for the next decade of Halo's universe. It also needed to introduce us to new characters and factions, as well as be as accessible as possible to potential new fans who'll be playing Halo for the first time. Halo Infinite's story needed to wear many hats, so to speak, and I think that it was able to wear all of those hats perfectly. What I found kind of interesting about Halo Infinite's story is that regret and guilt feel like a constant theme that underpins the narrative. 
I think a lot of folks were expecting the campaign to sort of shuffle Halo 5 under the rug and pretend it never happened, but Halo 5 and the legacy it had on the series is a major part of the story. What happened during Halo 5 constantly hangs over the characters, and the weight of what unraveled during that Reclaimer saga is heavy on the Master Chief. Cortana, the closest thing Chief had to a friend, really kind of lost it, and it hurt him. And Halo Infinite's campaign has Chief and his new AI companion moving through familiar locations and environments, fighting through familiar situations, and while I think it works really well as a throwback to Chief's friendship with Cortana during the trilogy, the story actually analyzes the way that the Halo universe seems to repeat itself, trapped in this never-ending loop, a loop that always leads back to a ring, a man in power armor, and his AI companion. And it's something that even the characters themselves are aware of. I love the protagonists of the story, but what about the villains? So the two main villains of the story are Eshram and the Harbinger, both of whom I think were handled with a lot of care. The Brutes, who are the leaders of the Banish, thrive in conflict. As an animal, they evolved and have cultures built around fighting and just living on the edge. With Eshram, you can see the effects of a life of high blood pressure, rage, and conflict on their species as it ages. Eshram is powerful, but clearly not in his prime anymore. His heart is weak, and he probably doesn't have long to live. The thought of dying peacefully with no conflict depresses him. He desperately wants to die in defense of his people. And throughout the story, he becomes fixated and then obsessed with the Master Chief. The Harbinger has her own goals for the ring, and Eshram's fixation on the Master Chief begins to create tension between himself and the Harbinger. I think it's a really interesting way to approach a villain, one that has a love and admiration for the protagonist, to the point that he sometimes loses focus on the Banished's goals. Where I think the villains do suffer is unfortunately a symptom of the game's one long take and more open world nature. There can't be any time jumps, it all has to feel very fluid, and the open world can't really change much. There's a point in the story where the Harbinger says, just unleash your army on the Master Chief, and Eshram says, no, an army won't be enough to stop him. And it made my eyebrows raise because of how just kind of nonsensical that logic is, until I realized, due to the open world nature of the game, you can't really jump from level to level, you know? each with their own theme, settings, and design. This game takes place in a centralized series of islands that can and will be backtracked through, played through again, and need to exist even after the main story is done. For the sake of open-world game design, the villains can't do anything that alters or damages the world in any permanent way. Otherwise, it will lock off the player from side content that they may have ignored during the early hours of the campaign. You can't have a massive takeover of a map, chunks of it being destroyed by glassing beams, forcing a retreat. Once forward operating bases are captured by the player, that place must be a permanent safe haven for the player that the villains cannot touch. That is a weakness that I think the villains in Halo Infinite story have. They have plans and they're well motivated, but they can't interfere with the player's open world freedom too much, which is a restriction that Halo didn't used to have in its past with its level by level design philosophy where the world could be dramatically altered depending on the level. Thankfully, the writers do make an admirable attempt to justify why the villains won't just permanently alter the world and destroy the player's progress, but if this does bug you in other open world games, you're gonna notice it in Halo Infinite. That same restriction also unfortunately extends to environmental variety. You're not exactly gonna be jumping from environment to environment like you were in Combat Evolved or Halo 2. This is an open world game. It took a lot of time to craft this environment. You're gonna be here the whole time. Just something for the series to consider as it moves on into the future if it wants to stick with this open world format. As for where the Halo universe goes from here, I can say this. I felt rather detached from Halo's universe following Halo 5's campaign. Halo Infinite wraps up the events of the Reclaimer Saga in a way that I didn't think possible. And the campaign ends in a way that leaves the door open for what comes next. And man, 
Am I excited about what comes next? The narrative team at 343 had an impossible task of repairing the damage done by Halo 5's story, wrapping up the Reclaimer saga, and setting the stage for the Chief's next journey. And I think it accomplished all those goals, and more. This is probably one of my favorite Halo stories in the series. And while I think the game could have done with a bit less of those MCU-style jokey joke quippy banter moments, the light-hearted nature of the story and its dialogue is well-balanced against the darker parts of the story, which also felt extremely well handled. It's a solid Halo story, and it has me excited to discuss it once the dust settles and all of you are caught up on spoilers. Halo Infinite is an ambitious Halo game. It's larger in scale than any previous Halo title, and while sometimes that does mean that the smaller details get lost in the vastness of the game world, I think the overall product is a net positive. This is the campaign that the series needed after Halo 5. People needed hope that the days of solid Halo campaigns weren't dead. 343 had a huge task on their hands, and they successfully, in my opinion, crafted their best Halo campaign to date, and one of my favorite shooters in a very long time. Where does it stack up in my personal list of favorite Halo titles? It's hard to say since the structure of it is so different from what came before, and it's also missing a lot of key features that I think would have allowed me to more accurately rank it up against other Halo titles. So currently, the campaign for Halo Infinite is missing co-op mode, theater mode, scoring and timing modes, checkpoint resetting, level selection, checkpoint selections, challenges, Marines being able to drive their own vehicles and ride on the sides of Scorpions, the ability to reset collectibles if you enjoy finding them, your progress carries across saves and there's no way to disable this, the ability to lower the crosshair on the screen, like the MCC, and the ability to turn off the hit marker visuals for increased immersion. Halo Infinite's campaign is coming in hot, and the rough development cycle that Halo Infinite had is felt in the end product, but the fact that the foundation is so solid regardless speaks to the talented developers at 343 when they do have strong leadership, and I'm hoping that they can build off the foundation that they have here. Halo Infinite is the campaign that Halo needed. It's still unfinished and missing a lot of key features, but with many of them already on the way and our feedback clearly being heard by 343, I have confidence that 343 can at least deliver most of these things that the campaign's missing. I encourage you to share the video around if you found it useful, and as always, leave me your thoughts down below. I'll see you guys on the next video, and I hope you enjoy the campaign, which releases soon.